Happy Sailor Nation. Very good. So this is one of the uh, talks we the group requested things on climate change. So this is one of our climate change talks. And uh, I'm very happy to introduce Professor John Allen. Uh, he, you can see he's at the University of Illinois. And I met John long ago, two, three, four years ago. And I can't remember. Uh, my cousin Terry Allen might be able to remind me where we met John, where, where I met Dixon. John. Dixon. In Dixon. Okay. There was a party in Dixon on the 4th of July, I believe. Is that right, Terry? It was a porch party. It was the, okay, the, good. The last porch party. My father had a big party on his front porch for about 60 years. And uh, John and Tom were both at that party on the front porch. And good. floats go by. And they met. And I'm glad you did. And I have to add something to that. So Tom asked me when he found out about what I do, if I would give a talk. And I refused to answer because the book he was asking about hadn't been finished yet. So, but I took his card and what is it? Two years later, I contacted him and told him I'm ready to, to his amazement. <laughs> and gratitude and appreciation. <laughs> So John, why don't you go ahead and start, uh, just to let you know, this is a group of active retirees. Most of us have college degrees. Uh, Plato is a participatory learning and teaching organization. Uh, you get to talk for 45, 50, 55 minutes, and then there'll be a QA. and a um, And if people want to chime in with a question, generally speaking, this is pretty informal. Um, while you're talking, that would be great also, and if that's all right with you. And, uh, great. I have two opportunities written into the talk for questions, but I, if some, if it's a question about a point I just made and you're confused, then you should type in. Also, can you please record this? Yeah, it's being um, live streamed, live streamed onto YouTube, and then that will become the archive. So that means it'll, it's being recorded by YouTube. Yes. Excellent. Mm -hmm. It makes it easier than just recording it on the Zoom. Okay, so as we just heard, I'm Professor John B. Allen, and I went to the University of Illinois, and I graduated in, never can remember, 61, 1961. That's why I'm such a young whippersnapper. Um, and then I went to the University of Pennsylvania, got my PhD, electrical engineering, and then I went to Bell Labs for 32 years in the acoustics research department. Then I retired. Thank God. There was nothing to thank God about. It was a great job. Um, and then I was invited to come to the University of Illinois, and I've been here ever since. And at the moment, I have no plans to retire. So I've had a very broad spectrum of, of uh, interactions with science that have given me a very broad perspective of what's going on. And um, so when I learned about the problem of climate change, I came an instant, instant um, I was cons really consumed with what could we do about this. And the funny thing was I knew zero thermodynamics and in order to solve that problem, you have to learn thermodynamics. So that was my first task. So the topic is desalinization of seawater by direct sunlight. And I had a subtitle here, Nature's Way, but it interfered with the talk and subtitles in the talk, so I took it out. But this is nature's, I'm inspired by nature. So what's the problem? The problem is called global warming, which isn't a very good term, but in order to satisfy certain prototypical minds, we have to call it global warming. Um, what and why? Well, the sun is the source of the problem. We could just put the sun out and we wouldn't have that problem anymore, but I don't think that would be a very good idea. And the sun is a black body radiator. The surface of the sun is about 7,000, but I think it's probably like more a million degrees inside. But instead of thinking about black body radiation, which you may not know anything about, or very little, think about a microwave oven and you put some water in the microwave and very quickly it heats up. Well, the sun is doing the same thing, but not to the water, but to carbon dioxide. 
in the atmosphere. And that carbon dioxide then <laughs> heated, transfers its heat to the earth, the ocean, whatever, everything. And then that slowly causes the temperature to rise because once the carbon dioxide has the heat, it can't get, there's no way to get rid of it except wait a thousand years. So here's the basic setup. We have the sun and the earth, and this is not to scale. So this is a 400 times scale down, scale down the sun, scale down the earth. Uh, probably the earth is one unit and this is scaled down by 400 and the distances are as well. It takes eight minutes for light to go from the sun to the earth. So that gives you some kind of an idea of how far away it is. It's a long distance. It's a very unique situation. Just because you have a planet near a sun like, the, like our sun doesn't mean you're gonna have life there. Something else is required. One thing is low CO2. We have 400 parts per million of CO2. It's something like 0.04% of our atmosphere. Oh, it's just slowly climbing as we'll learn. And if it gets over 400, which it was for a long, long time, thousands if not more years, then it trips the energy balance. It doesn't take very much carbon dioxide to change the situation. Now, how we can learn about this by looking at Mars. Mars's atmosphere is 95% carbon dioxide. And it had lots of water. And I think the time scale was a billion years ago, but the water disappeared. Is there water on Mars today? That's not particularly controversial, but where it went may be. So the water is gone. Well, in some sense it's gone. And there's this nice video which is not very long, that talks about this. Um, it's a written article in the New York Times, and you can see um, it was the March 19th. But let's go back to the beginning here. If I, well, I guess I have to, I don't have any control over that. That's a picture of Mars. This is produced by Goddard Space Flight Center. The blue parts are the water. And this is probably, um, I don't know how long this video is depicting Mars, but the white thing at the top is the polar caps. So this is what Mars looks like today, roughly. It's got a polar cap, but it's a desert. And here's what it looked like, I'm saying a billion years ago, I don't know the actual date. So it had a lot of water on it. And we know that for a fact, because you can see the erosion. And if you've ever seen a picture of Mars, which is highly likely, you've seen the erosion. But then as time went by, the water disappeared. And one thing that can happen is that it'll freeze and it can turn into water vapor when the sun shines on it. There's a lot of possible things that cause it to disappear. But according to this article, what happened is some of it went into space. Mars was once wet. Um, today, Mars is dry as the desert, except for ice deposits on its polar regions, where'd the water go? Some of it disappeared into space, but most of it probably just 99% of the water is still there embedded in the rocks down below. That's a theory, but it's supported by some data, some good data. Okay, so that's a very, worrisome prediction of what's going to happen to Earth. If the carbon dioxide goes from where it is right now to 99%, it doesn't have to get close to that number, um, something very serious will happen. So I know there's, we all know there's controversy about the existence of solar warming, but there is no controversy about the uh, carbon dioxide levels since 1950. It was interesting that a University of Illinois professor started measuring the carbon dioxide back in the 1950s um, on Hawaii. And that's why we have this record. Now, you have to appreciate what's going on here. This is showing the parts per million of the carbon dioxide. There's two different scales here, and I forget what the two are, but this is, this is approximately parts per million, I think. Um, so back in 1960, it was like 480 and earlier it was like 400, and it's going up. 
And you can see that the slope changes from here to there. So in 1980, the slope went up a little teeny bit. And there's this oscillation sitting on top of it, which you might well ignore. It's shown in this upper corner. Can you see my mouse? Tom? Yeah, we can see the mouse. Yep. And here is a five year span from 2015 to 2020. I've clipped off the zero, it seems. So it shows that there's this oscillation, just like in the left hand, upper left hand corner, there's this oscillation in the carbon dioxide. It goes up, then it comes down, then it goes up. Now it stays down longer, shorter, then it goes up. It's most of the time it's going up. That, so it's the integral under this curve that leads to the long-term change. So it originally increased by one and a two thirds parts per million each year. So it increased hundred parts per million in 60 years. And it's very predictable what's going to happen. It can just get worse because the slope is increasing. So it doesn't take much imagination to know why the slope is increasing. We're measuring the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and it's going up. So the slope has increased to two parts per million um, in the last 20 years. I, th I think that's per, per, per year. So it increased from one and two thirds to two. In the last in the last year, and that's what it's been for the last twenty years. That sentence isn't very clear. So it oscillates. Why does it oscillate? This is the key to understanding what's going on. In the summer, it decreases, and in the winter, it increases. So what's going on? Well, the Earth is on an axis. Oh, I don't have to do that. This is gonna be automatic, I think. Oh, I'm going in the wrong direction. So the earth is at an angle and as it goes around the sun, so at one point the sun is shining on the Southern portion and the other time it's shining on the Northern portion. And so when it's shining on the Northern portion, we call that summer and the, uh, the CO2 drops. When it's shining on the southern portion, the CO2 rises and it just oscillates back and forth and it rises more than it drops. And so there's a net increase. So why does it drop in the summertime? Because there's more foliage, there's more green stuff on the northern hemisphere than on the southern hemisphere. So when the northern hemisphere is exposed to the sun, that's enough to cause the net carbon dioxide to go down. And when the sun is pointing at the southern hemisphere, it goes up. So the Amazon forest is in the summer in the southern hemisphere. You burn that down, this is gonna get much, much worse, which is exactly what they're doing. So I went over this. So CO2, this correlates very nicely with so-called temperature change or the melting of the ice caps, fires, all of the things when you lose, when the temperature goes up, the water evaporates and there's less water, groundwater, and all hell breaks loose, basically. It's also the source of, of the changing pH of the ocean, which is this car, uh, carbonic acid, which when the carbon dioxide is very soluble in the ocean water, and once it's in there, it produces, it changes the pH um, of the ocean, which this does all sorts of damage. We'll learn more about that. Now, you need to understand some very, very fundamental thermodynamics. This is ice <clears throat> at absolute zero Kelvin degrees, which is minus 273. So as you add heat, let's say you're putting in a constant heat so from the sun, the ice temperature will rise until it gets to zero degrees. At that point, the ice starts thawing. This is where we are right now, because the ice is thawing. And then it'll continue to thaw, and we know the, exactly what the equation for that is, because we know C sub P, and we know what the heat input is, so we can predict how long, you can just watch the ice melt and predict how long it's gonna take to melt. It's gonna take a while, so that's our window of opportunity. If we don't do something during this period, period of thawing, I think uh, toast is a word that comes to mind. So during this 
thawing period, the change in the heat is, is changing at a constant rate and the temperature is constant. So when ice melts, the water stays at the constant temperature. Now you might think if we have global warming, why isn't it getting warming? Well, it shouldn't, it should get colder. Why? Because if you take a glass of water and you throw some ice in there and the ice melts, the water gets colder. So global warming predicts that the air temperatures will get warmer. And that's what, well, it's water, you have to average all the temperature over the entire earth, which is not a trivial matter. Once it reaches all the ice is melted, then the water starts, the temperature starts to rise again. And it doesn't take, it takes a long time, but at some point it boils. At that point, there's no life on earth anymore. Once the ice is thawed, the water eventually boils. This is guaranteed. The only way to stop this is to change the equation, change the amount of heat going in. At 100 degree C, the temperature again remains constant until all the water is turned to steam. Those are just easy. This is an experiment that you do in physics 101. It's a very, very simple experiment and very well understood. Okay, some people say we don't have enough water. Well, that's absurd. We have the oceans, but of course, the oceans have salt in them. How much salt do they have in them? Is it a lot of salt? Well, if you taste it, it's enough to make you gag. It seems like it's a lot of salt, but it's not. So massive desalination of the oceans is the solution, but how can we do that? So this is my solution, and we are presently in the process of proving that this works in the lab, but thermodynamics tells us that it's going to work. It's just a matter of getting everybody to believe us. So, you know, there's a lot of social uh, incorrectness going on around and it's easy to lie about something in denial. So we can't have any of that. So we have to do an experiment. So when you warm water, temperature goes up and it evaporates. And then you take the evaporated water and you condense it. And the, the evaporated water is pure water. The salt can't evaporate. The salt stays in the brine and it concentrates in the brine. And so if you use the hot water vapor and you expose it through a condenser to the cold water, you can heat the cold water, increasing the rate of heating, and you can cool the vapor and cause it to condense. And so you get pure water out at about 20 degrees. If the ocean is 15 degrees centigrade, you can cool, cool it well below its dew point to get almost all of the water vapor out. So when you heat it to 40 degrees, you get 5% by mass of the water goes to vapor and then you cool it and that energy that went into vaporizing it goes back into the ocean, heating the ocean up more, not just the sun part, but all of the, it's the integral under the sun part, time integral. So this cycle can produce huge amounts of water at a very low cost because the energy source is the sun. So the goal is to use the sun as the source of energy to applied to seawater to extract pure water, and we'd like that to be as efficient as possible. But how do we do that? Well, here's an early diagram. My brother is a architect and he just sat down and drew this freehand. Um, so you have the ocean over here, and let's say it's between 15 and 20 degrees C. 15 is a reasonable number, especially if you get deep ocean water. And you have to pump it. That takes a little bit of electricity, but not, not a lot. You pump it up and maybe you pump it up 100 feet. Maybe you pump it. You got to pump it up high enough so gravity will carry it down. And this platform is exposed to the sun and it's covered with glass. So you have a glass film over the top. So the light can get in, but the heat can't get out. This is a, likely a thermopane or some kind of an insulator. And the water is sitting down here in some channels and it's flowing slowly towards this lake. This could be a hundred miles long. It could be a thousand miles long. It could be one mile long. So, and this could be modular. It doesn't have to be one container. It wouldn't be a good idea to make it one container. So it'd be a good idea to make this 
like three square meter things that are all glued together. And uh, that's the details. So this is water and the water is heated by the sun and we're using a target value of 40 degrees and it evaporates, 5% of the water evaporates, then you suck it out, it doesn't show it, but there's little holes in the top of this channel and it sucks down below and there's an aluminum sheet down below. And so the water vapor goes back towards the ocean where the water is cold over here and warm over here. It's 40 degrees somewhere in this region and it's 15 or 20 degrees somewhere in this region. So you, you, should, you blow the water vapor, which is very light, doesn't take any energy much at all. You have a vacuum down here, you suck the water vapor down towards the cold water and that causes the cold water to condense. And when it condenses, the only place it can get, that it's condensing against is the cold water. So it heats the water even more than the sun did. So it's a feedback loop of the water vapor, hot water vapor being shot down back towards the source, heating up the cold water, causing it to condense. And then we drain the water off and we pump it into a freshwater lake. Okay. So that's verbal explanation and you have the picture to go with it. So in, in this diagram, we were talking 60 degrees, which is fine. I mean, it's possible to get it as high as 60 degrees, then 5% isn't the right number of by mass. It's much higher than that. It's an exponential relationship between the temperature and the dew point of water, which is 100% humidity point. So we're condensing it down to 20. We can't get it back to 15 because that violates thermodynamics, but we probably could get it back to 20 or 25. And the lower the temperature, the more water vapor escapes as water. So now I have another video which was made uh, that describes the entire process all over again, and then we'll have an opportunity for questions. So please write down your questions. Humanity faces an existential crisis like none it has ever faced before. Is the video everything working, Tom? Yes, it is. If you want to enlarge your screen, that'd be fine too. Um, You're good. I'd just go with that. Climate change is not simply a matter of global warming. Severe weather, intense fires, and rising seas have huge impacts, aggravated by the demands of Earth's increasing population. Potable water and food are problems as serious as the implications of climate change. Our innovative approach to desalination uses thermodynamics to separate ocean water into potable water and salt. In figure two, we propose a synergistic single solution to the many problems facing humanity. With the sun as a sole source of thermal energy, we can heat the cold seawater to over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Given this one square meter of solar input, 61 kilograms of water will be heated to well over 100 degrees Fahrenheit raising the humidity to 5%, thus releasing three kilograms of pure water vapor. Scaling up, one square mile of the Sahara Desert is 2.6 million square meters, releasing 8 million liters or 8,000 tons of pure water each day. This amount of water can create thousands of huge lakes and arid deserts to grow plants. As these arid wastelands evolve into jungles, they will naturally remove the carbon dioxide from the air. Water and food will become a free resource. Uh, okay, so I'm going to have, it's a Q&A period now. Um, this video is available if you, um, it's on YouTube. I'm listening to it from YouTube. And so going back to the presentation, um, I think this is a good time for questions because I've tried to explain what's going on, how it works, and what the concept is. And I'd like to add that we're actually testing this in the lab. Questions? So if you'd like to unmute folks or unmute and show um, your video, that'd be great if you have any questions. Um, so John, I wanted to ask you um, the, if you have this water, new amounts of water available, um, the ultimate goal then is to give is to place more water onto the desert areas of the earth? 
thereby allowing more plants to grow? There are areas in the earth that are particularly free of water, they're arid regions. And those are also the same places where there's lots of sunlight. And so mm. people would hopefully be highly motivated to try to plant those. So I'm thinking of the Sahara Desert. I'm also thinking of the West Coast in California, maybe near wine country, something like that. There's, there's a lot of plant, a lot of food that's grown in California. We could have a one square mile test facility there cost a million dollars probably. But um, it's well worth, as long as we can prove the technology and come up with a good enough design. I'm not sure I'm answering your, I'm over answering your question. Yes, we would grow lakes and it would be nice to start in places that need the water. California, because of the fires, needs the water. Obviously the Sahara Desert and the other place is in Australia. So if you took all the deserts in Australia and in Africa, and you populated them with lakes and grew jungles, that would solve the problem. That's been calculated by somebody. Did I answer your question? Um, yes, I think I understand. So the idea is to grow more forests and more plants in order to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the air. There's obviously two goals here. One goal is to, up. one goal is to create water, we, we need water. And the other goal is to solve the carbon dioxide problem. Well, you can't solve the carbon dioxide problem without solving the water problem because you can't grow trees if you don't have water. You can't grow trees with salt water. So this is a double whammy. It's doing two things at once. We're doing two things at once. We're desalinating water and we're getting huge amounts of it, energy speaking for free, because we're using the sun. And then we're turning the Sahara Desert, if it had water, would grow trees and plants. And then you could populate this with animals. People could live underneath the platform. So it's a, it's a synergistic solution to the problem. Now, did I answer your question? Does this process uh, raise the salt level of the ocean? No. And should I answer why it doesn't increase the salt level? It actually does good things to the ocean because it lowers the pH. If you're taking carbon dioxide in the form of um, calcium carbonate ultimately out of the ocean, you're lowering the pH and so that makes it healthier like it was a thousand years ago. And you're not raising the salt level because you're taking, I'll answer that question in the next slide or two. So let's hold off on that. It's a very, very important point. There's no salt goes back into the ocean because it comes out as salt and you pile it up. And then what do you do with that salt? Well, salt's worth a lot of money all by itself. Somebody jokingly said, um, well, we'll just take the salt and we'll mine it for gold and gold coins will come out. Well, I'm not sure how realistic that is, but it's a cute hypothesis. Did I answer your question? Not completely. Yes. <laughs> and John, what would be the um, albedo effect of not only having the solar collectors, <laughs> but also the growing plants? converting hot sands into cooler uh, grasslands or savanna or forest? Well, the only thing intelligent I can say about that is it's not gonna make it worse, it's gonna make it better. Um, can we, we're using sunlight and we're converting it into water vapor, we're storing the energy and then we're taking that energy to reheat more water. Um, I'm not sure that effect is going to reduce the, you, you, the, the way to get the temperature down is to get control of the carbon dioxide. And the way to get control of the carbon dioxide is to grow plants and let the natural processes take place. And the world would be a better place with more. The Sahara Desert, as I understand it, used to be a jungle. So that, that's why I was just wondering what, if you, even if it's not a huge slice of the pie, what 
size of the ply, the albedo, reducing the amount of heat reflected back in the atmosphere might be. Um, so you're capturing it. So I can't answer the question because I haven't studied it. I've been concentrating on the basic thermodynamics of the process, but it's not going to aggravate the situation. You're not going to send, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that I, I see it as a benefit. I was just wondering if it's been quantifiable. I don't know enough about that. And uh, that might be something to work on in the future for with the yeah, students that I, are uh, working on your project with you. I agree, but it's a second order effect. So I'm yep. concerned with primary effects at the moment. I'm really good at second order effects. <laughs> you, haven't, had, you haven't mentioned the ocean level of water and how it's affected. I'm... I just had an accident on my screen and I got a message and I was reading it. Please repeat the question. You haven't mentioned the level of the ocean water, which we're now afraid is rising. Does this affect? Well, that's a really interesting question. So we're taking, let's say we took half the ocean and did this, which is impossible. Well, what are we doing with the water? We're putting it on the soil and yeah. the sun is shining on it and it's evaporating and it's creating rain. And the rain runs and it goes into rivers and it goes back into the ocean. You can't get rid of water. Well, you could, but we won't do that. You could turn, there's ways of turning water into gas, hydrogen and oxygen, and you might want to little, do a little bit of that. But no, we're not destroying the water. The water, we're just removing the salt. The next slide is extremely important. How much salt is there in the ocean. Hey, John, can I ask a question before you move on? I'm not moving on. I'm just pointing this one. Yeah, you can ask a question, but just let me look. There's only 0.04% of carbon dioxide in the ocean, and there's only three and a half percent by mass of water. So if you removed all of the water and you're left with the salts, it doesn't vary much. Go ahead, ask your question. Well, it, it, it builds on the last one, and I just wanted to make it maybe a little bit more uh, relevant. Or, um, and how much water would it take from the ocean to create a jungle, say, half the size of the Amazon? Has that ever been calculated? I mean, the Amazon is such an important sink for CO2, and to have um, an effect, you're going to have to have something that's ultimately at least a fraction, if not the same size as the Amazon, correct? And the question is, how much water would that take? Would it noticeably reduce the ocean level? All the water you take out of the ocean and remove the salt eventually ends up back in the ocean. So the, water, the, the reason the ocean is rising right now, which is not a good thing, is because the polar caps are melting. So if we get the temperature back down to the point where the polar caps would come back, that would be fantastic. I'm hoping that someday, you know, 50, 100, 1,000 years from now, that might be possible. But we've carried this equation way too far, too long, and the polar caps are melting. So the temperature is going up, and that's causing <clears throat> the water, and the ice caps, and there's a lot of it to melt, which is causing the ocean to rise. So we, you could sit, claim incorrectly that we're reducing the amount of water rising by taking some out and removing the salt, but it's not really true because when you remove the water from the ocean and remove the salt and put it into a lake, it's just gonna evaporate and go back into the ocean. So we're not really gonna impact that equation very much. I had a question. I, I, it feels to me like you're being a bit simplistic about what the effects of this on other environments or ecosystems might be. Um, I remember I'd read an article recently about the um, adverse effects of covering the deserts with solar panels, for instance. Um, That's a very different thing, by the way. Okay, but so these don't act like solar panels? No, they act like lakes when you get done evaporating I mean, the water, yes. You think it's a good idea or a bad idea, and if you think it's a bad idea, please make the argument that if we converted the Sahara Desert or the deserts in Australia into jungles, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. 
Okay, it well, might be a bad thing depending on on what this um, what the consequences are of doing that. The consequences are that with more plant life, I, look, you can always stop the process if you want to. If it turns out you're making doing creating jungles and they're causing a problem, you can just stop, turn it off, cut, cut the power, and go kill some trees. It's easy to reverse this process, but it's very hard to make it move forward. I can't, personally, I can't imagine an argument that says that creating jungles like the Amazon is a bad thing. Now, there was a book just recently came out talking about how we try to solve one problem with another scientific problem and it creates lots of issues. And I agree with the author of that book. I can't remember her name off the top of my head, but um, she really makes some excellent points. And I agree almost 100% with everything she said, maybe 100%. But this is not one of those things. This is doing it nature's way. We're trying to create more jungles. There used to be jungles there. We're trying to reduce the carbon dioxide. There used to be lower carbon dioxide. We're trying to reduce the pH of the ocean. There used to be lower pH of the ocean. And there used to be huge lakes in the middle of the US. And we drained them all. No, that's happened a long time ago. And you're talking about these jungles, which were a long time ago. Yep. That's, why, that's why I say, I think it's a bit simplistic from it what is, I'm hearing. I'm attempting to be simplistic. This is one of the things that's wrong with all of these models of global warming. They try to put every single variable into the equation and they ignore the most important ones and they confuse people that, oh, there's all these other greenhouse gases. Why aren't you worried about those? Because those don't play a big role. This is all about carbon dioxide. So I'm, it's a good model, simplifies it to the essence. Now that doesn't mean that the model explains everything, but we need, we have a panic situation on our hands and we need some way of reversing the trend. And this is highly simplified document, highly simplified procedure for about how we could go about that. And it goes in the direction that we need fresh water. You wouldn't argue with that, right? Hello? Yeah, I'm here. We need okay. fresh water. Go ahead. Um, I was just gonna say, um, you, it takes, you know, to go, it takes a very complex soil composition to grow different kinds of plants. It's a long way from a desert soil composition to get all the way to the amazingly complex soil of a jungle. So it would be many years before that environment would be developed in that situation. But this may be a way to start it. I did hear about a man who, um, was in the desert in Africa and he um, planted in, he collected dung and the beetles came and created nests in the dung. And from that, he created an oasis of plants in the desert and his village grew because of it. So this is a, something that is possible to do. It is going to be years before a jungle will be growing because it takes a long time to get the the biomass and the soil to, to grow. Well, this is, I'm thinking on the scale of 50 years or hundred years. Mm -hmm. So yes, I agree with everything you just said. John, if I could uh, chime in with what Kathleen was saying, I'm wondering when you get to a large, um, large enough size of grassland or forest or jungle, they can start making their own weather and climate. And so I think one of the possible unintended consequences is that um, it might be a happy consequence is that it gets big enough that it starts um, making its own weather climate so that rainfall patterns change. They'll and, increase. Yeah. And then the idea that if it gets, if there's an unintended unhappy consequence, you wouldn't just be able to pull the plug on it. Um, and this is, many decades down 
the line, but I think that might be- It's a slow enough process. If something goes wrong, you can stop it. You have complete control of it. We don't have a complete control of the angle of the earth as it goes around <coughs> the sun. And we don't have control <coughs> on the temperature of the sun. There's a lot of things we don't have control of, but this is something we have total control of. Yeah, a little Garden of Eden. Go ahead, Mark. My point that I've made before is the desert is not where we need fresh water. We need it in a highly concentrated populated area. That, uh, well, Mark, that would first you need water. Because people are living in their own waste in many environments. And if we can drain or produce more water, we can cleanse um, our, these villages or these municipalities. The first time I gave this talk. Grow plants, gardening, um, but having visited the, some of these areas, they can't cleanse their environment from their waste. Because they don't have water. They don't have water. Yeah, but you can do this on, this is scalable and it's, you can scale it up, you can scale it down. You can make it one square mile and it's enough to produce 8,000 tons of water a day um, on average. So that's enough water to solve a small village easily. So every 100 miles, every 50 miles, you have a one square mile of, of this process and you're probably good to go. You build them up as you need them. Help. Yeah, go ahead. Cost per liter. Well, everybody asks me that question. And I don't, I don't have the answer because you have to actually come up with an actual design. How much is it going to cost to make the glass film? Are you going to buy um, expensive uh, thermal panes from what's the company that sells the Anderson windows? I don't think so. You're going to have to come up with a cheap way of making this. And so you can't really estimate how much it's gonna cost. The other answer to that question is, who cares how much it costs? I'm gonna deal with this issue with my last slide if I ever get there. <laughs> You'll get there, John. Um, I don't care how much it costs, we gotta do it. I'm wondering if uh, you can get cost per liter um, based on at least a top side based on the current cost per liter of desalination, large scale desalination for drinking water. Yeah, large scale desalination is mostly done by reverse osmosis, which is very, very- Oh, yeah, uh, I didn't realize that. A lot of electricity. I have a question. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that you were in the process of proving this as a tenable solution. Yes. Where are you in that process and what are your next steps? It sounds intriguing. I hope it so works. The mechanical engineering department has a senior design project and every student is required to go through it. And last semester, we had the first try through this. And this semester, we're taking a second try. And I'd say we're a lot smarter the second time around. The first time around, we kind of proved that it works, but the water got the desalinated water got mixed with the salt water. So the salt came back and it was a lot of flaws. And we're a lot more intelligent about how we're doing it. And we're halfway through the semester. Um, I haven't checked in in the last week. Um, these students make a lot of mistakes, um, just like all students do, and they need a lot of guidance. And um, I'm doing my very, very best to provide that, but I make mistakes too. So. Um, it's going forward and it might take a couple of tries, but I think this semester, I think we're going to actually get to the point where we can prove that it all works to have a working prototype. And there's a company that Jenny Allen's, this is Rod's daughter, works for um, Burns McDonald and they're totally supportive and they said they would build a prototype if we came up with some kind of a design. And so that's another possibility, which I think would be really cool is to go to Burns McDonald up in Chicago area and have them make some prototypes that are, you know, like 20 by 20 feet or something like that. 
And then we can try them out in California and see if it works, which it will. It, be, it would be so good if we could um, work on this earth-wide pr problem in a way different from how we've approached the um, vaccination for COVID problem and make sure that we're sharing the information worldwide, not competing and not having one or two companies become focused on making all the profit from this. I have intentionally not tried to make any patents on this. And I was okay. asked about that. Is this patentable? Can we, you know, explore this? And I said, I'm purposely putting in the public domain so that nobody can patent the idea and claim it's their own. That's great, John. That's great. Life's hard enough. I have a lot of experience with patents and at this point, I don't basically don't believe in them. They're counterproductive. Can I go on? Any more questions? Absolutely. That would be great. Okay. So as I said, if you look at the composition of seawater, it turns out to be fantastically in our advantage because the salt is only three and a half percent of the water. So if you took the water and reduced it down to the same magnitude of the salt, three 35 grams from a kilogram, you can't read this, but this is based on one liter of water, which is one kilogram. So you go down to three and a half grams of water and three and a half grams of salt. That's enough so that the salt will start to precipitate out. You don't want to go that far down. You probably want seven grams of water. So you're going to reduce the water by almost an order of magnitude, if not an order of magnitude. And you're going to get all the water out as pure water and it'll be concentrated as a salty brine with one third salt and two thirds water. And if you try to go further than that, it'll start to precipitate out and create problems in your system. It'll clog up the system. So, and that salt is not just sodium chloride, although that's most of it. Chloride is 55%, sodium is 30%, and then there's some sulfates and here's the breakdown. So um, CO2 is really minor. It's this is the calcium is 0.42 grams. So knowing this is the concentration is a critical point because if it was 50% sodium chloride and 50% water, you'd be pretty much screwed because you wouldn't be able to get enough water. There'd be so much salt being generated. You have no place to put it. But if it's only three and a half grams per kilogram, salt's actually worth something. So it's not a bad deal. Um, and you're changing the, this actually in that small quantity that changes the pH by a significant amount, makes the ocean unhealthy just by that tiny amount of salt or adding the carbon dioxide. I said salt, I meant the carbon dioxide. 400 parts per million going to 500 parts per million raises the pH enough to kill plants, animals, and corals destruction of the coral reef. Life in the ocean to be, begins on the coral reefs. Evaporation gives us pure water, leaving the salt behind. And the water can be used to grow plant, plants in the desert and they consume the CO2. So this is a repeat, this is the third time I've said that. Without potable water, you can't grow plants. I've had that question, can you grow water with, can you grow plants with salt water? No. Okay, so massive desalinization. This is another review just to make sure everybody gets it. So the, the amount of CO2 is going up. And when it crossed a long time ago, the 400 parts per million point, that's where the temperature started to go up and we were leading into um, the polar caps getting ready to melt. So can, can we use direct sunlight to, that's supposed to be heat, and evaporate cold seawater? And if so, how? Well, I've told you how the sun heats the salt water up to, let's say, 40 degrees or higher is better. And then the water evaporates, and that's a pure, water is pure. The water vapor is just a, individual molecules of water floating around in the air and there's no salt. Salt's very heavy by comparison to water. 
And then you take that water vapor when it's close to the dew point, which is 100% humidity, and you suck it down and you pass it underneath the platform where there's a heat exchanger and you condense it by cooling it down to 20 degrees. You can't go as far as 15 because that violates thermodynamics, but you can go down a lot below 40 or 60 degrees and there's an exponential relationship between the amount of water vapor and the temperature. So it's not linear at all. So if you go down to 20 degrees, you've gotten most of the water vapor condensed. So when you cool the water vapor, it releases all of the energy that went into creating the water vapor. So you heat water and it evaporates. You can do this experiment on your stove top. You just put a liter of water in a big pan and turn on the heat and say, how long does it take for all the water vapor to go away? And you're left with the residual, you put some salt in it, you'll see the salt at the bottom of the pan. I did this the other day. It took me from nine o'clock in the morning until noon to get rid of a liter of the temperature of the stove was very, very low. Um, so when the water vapor condenses, all of that energy, unless it's lost through the walls of the container, all of it will go into the hot, into the cold water, heating it up. So you get a, what is this about? Um, so it's a feedback loop. And this is exactly where what I'm proposing is different from what everybody else has been proposing. This has been mentioned, but they said you can't do it. There's an article that I have that says you could do this, but you can't do it. It's not efficient, <clears throat> but I'm showing how to make it efficient. And I haven't talked about that. So you can increase the yield basically to, you can maximize the yield, which means you can make it 100%. So the amount of heat that'll go in is the integral of all of the heat that went in during the entire day. So the process can go into the night and you could supplement the process with reactors if you wanted or any, any other source of electricity. You can put heaters in the water and heat it up electrically. And, but that's not good because that's not green. So in summary, pure seawater, seawater sea with salt produces pure salt water, pure water, can't read, and salt. And there's solar panels are highly inefficient. 23% is theoretically the best that they can do today. So four fifths of the energy is lost in a solar panel. That's no solution. And RO, reverse osmosis is also power, power hungry. That's a terrible way and it clogs up the membranes. It's a very complicated process. You gotta have super high pressures to get to separate the salt from the water. It's just, everybody will tell you right up front, it's not a very efficient method. Um, what we want is green. We want no power. We don't, we don't, it says no power hungry RO. We want green. So main question is how much of the heat of vaporization is resulting in condensed, can it be recovered? The answer is yes. So you heat the water, you get 5% or more vapor, you cool it. And during the cooling, you recover all of the energy and um, what's the maximum temperature that the sun can raise the water to? Well, you can boil water, but it requires a pretty complicated setup with a lot of mirrors to concentrate the sunlight. But you don't need to. 40 degrees is more than enough. 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 110 degrees Fahrenheit would be desirable and get you into a range where you can get a decent rate of return of water vapor. Um, so the proper heat exchanger design and assuming cold inlet seawater of 15 at most 20 degrees C, then the efficiency of this whole process can be very high. And I'm saying, you know, like 95% or something. And that's something we want to actually prove. It depends on the insulation. You need a lot of styrofoam, but styrofoam I believe is cheap. So the design must flow the water vapor underneath the inlet to get to the, to expose it to the cold seawater cooling the vapor and heating the inlet water, thereby creating an integral. You integrate all the heat that goes into the system by insulating it well enough with styrofoam so that you, you have a heat loss maybe through the glass. If you have a thermopane 
with argon in between, that's a pretty good insulator that lets all of the light through. So there's some design issues there I haven't tried to deal with. Okay, so who's gonna pay for it? Well, this is philosophical. Nobody wants to pay for it, but our choice is to be or not to be, that is the question. Somebody better pay for it. Look, the railroads and auto industry, mostly the auto industry, well, the railroads are interesting because people who made the railroads all became billionaires. So there's money to be made here. We're used to free water. We just pump it out of the ground. Well, that's going away. We've pumped all of the water out of the ground. There's plenty of places today, like India, where there is no more water under the ground. So they got to find another source. So you got to go from a model where you get free water for the price of pumping it up to paying for it. So we need a cheap way of doing it. And the energy is the biggest component to the cost. So the railroad industry proves to me that you can make a lot of money if you jump on this bandwagon because there's a lot of money to be made. So this is not that negative. You're gonna get a lot of billionaires out of this industry, I predict. The other interesting example is the audio, auto industry. So the auto industry pumps all the oil out of the ground for almost nothing. Then they sell it for you know $3 a gallon. They take that money and put it in the bank and they become rich off of a natural resource which should just stay in the ground, which is that oil. So they've made a lot of money. You basically you need to reverse everything, all the damage that the auto industry has done over the last hundred plus years. They've burned all this oil, creating all this carbon dioxide, and they put the money in their banks, and they're the wealthy people. And they, I think they should pay for it. Break them, I don't care. Well, don't quote me. So who's going to pay for it? Well, to be or not to be, that's the question. All the billionaires and the millionaires in the United States and all over the world have made their money on railroads or the automobile industry. There's a huge need for inexpensive transportation as in India. I'm not sure what my point is there. Today, there's a huge need for cheap and clean water. So we gotta have a different way of doing transportation. And I think that there's clever people that have figured out how to do that. There's a lot of, you know, electric cars are actually much better than gasoline cars. That's been demonstrated categorically. They're more efficient. They have better torque. They are easy to take, you know, like my Prius. I'm doing 45 miles a gallon because of some good design features in the Prius. When you put the brake on, it doesn't create heat. It create, charges the battery. Water industry today and the transportation industry of the 1820s in the United States have a great deal in common. And we need to see that relationship and capitalize and repeat that absolutely fantastic billion, billionaires that were created by the railroad industry. They use steam power, water, you heat the water, you boil it, you create steam. There's a huge amount of energy in that steam. There's a lot in common between the railroad industry and our problems today. There's a huge opportunity here. Clean water is equivalent to megabucks. A business model is needed to proceed. And I'm probably not the right guy for that. So I'm done. And maybe it's time for more questions or comments. More or questions or comments. Or thoughts. So on the one side, I had uh, John was uh, temperature. You're talking about doing this, uh, say, at the equator at the Sahara, which is equator and a little bit north, um, up to about 15, 20 degrees north. Um, the ocean water there is pretty warm already, probably above that uh, 20, 25 degree. If you go deep, I don't think so. Correct. And so how do you pump that water? Is that what your... Uh... Well, the amount of energy to pump the water from a mile down up to the surface is practically nothing because the density has changed only a little teeny bit. And the only thing you're pumping against at the head is the density. Once it comes up into the air, then it takes a lot of energy to pump it up because you're lifting right. it in air. And that's what you're, uh, you, you showed some uh, uh, windmills. Is, I'm assuming that's what you were going to 
use yeah, the windmills are there to run the pumps to get the water up into okay. the platform. Good. Other questions, comments? Yeah, I was just wondering uh, if you had any thoughts of how the uh, the glass would be cleaned um, over time if they're if these are like unmanned or uh, maybe they are manned by robotics. Um, is there a, a simple method to clean these uh, from you know calcified minerals? I have thought about this question, and all I have is some cute answers. I want to take all of the Syrians who are being murdered and all of the peoples around the world who are experiencing racist behavior and offer them a plot of land in the Sahara Desert with all of the animals and sheep and camels that they want and let them grow it. And their job will be to go up and clean the windows. Now they won't keep <laughs> The, the thing that's going to make the, the be the biggest problem is their sandstorms in the desert. Eventually, if you had enough, the, those, those sandstorms would eventually go away, but there will be there far into the future. So you need to get a broom and sweep the sand off. I don't know. I mean, um, it's a practical problem. You could have something that lifts the structure up and dumps all of the sand off. You could have a blower that blows it off. I don't have a really hmm. thoughtful answer, but it is a problem, but not a super large problem. Yeah, Plastic I mean, get dirty. You know, I had another solution. You have a plastic roller and you just roll the surface onto one roller from another roller. So you have clean plexiglass, I mean, clean, um, you have clean uh, plastic, double layered plastic, so you've got an insulator and you just turn a crank and there's a motor that runs this plastic off of a big roller onto another roller and it goes down below where it can be cleaned and put on another roller. And when you've rolled all the plastic from one place to the other and you've cleaned it down below where you're not in the sun, then you reverse the motor and you go the other way around. So, I mean, it's a, yeah. an attempt at being a creative solution. I mean, uh, nature is always the best designer. So maybe looking at like the lotus flower and uh, how nature uses its own hydrophobic uh, structure. But, you know, it's a, they already have something like that right now, but it's a little expensive. So maybe over time uh, with, you know, being able to make a, a large quantity of these, it would- Sounds like you have some creative thoughts on this topic. Yeah. <laughs> Is that Dan? Yeah. I'm just guessing from your voice. I don't have the speaker's picture up here. I'm... Okay, yeah, yeah, I think it's a it's an important problem, but it's a secondary. First, you have to build a structure and get it working. True. And then you do have to clean it. And I love the idea of getting people who can't, they're just being murdered by their head of their countries, like in Syria, and offer them a place to go. At first, they're going to be reticent. They're not going to believe it. But you know, you have a few pioneers that could go there and prove that it works, and then they'll ask their relatives, etc. So I do think that people could live underneath this structure and have a nice life, have a good education. And my thoughts on this: that there should be one rule: you cannot have guns in this place, and you have to live somebody you have to live next door to somebody who has a different color than your skin. Those are two rules. That'll be easily done. Um, <laughs> other questions for John? This is Morris. I don't Where know if you can Morris. see. Uh, Professor uh, Jim Beckman at the Arizona State University developed a process called evaporation maybe 20 years ago, which was eventually commercialized. Uh, it's been a while since I looked at it, but it used polypropylene sheets and sunlight in a, a static system to uh, purify water used mostly at uh, oil wells to concentrate the brine for uh, reinjection. Uh, are you familiar with his work? Because your uh, process sounded somewhat similar to me. I think I read about it once on the internet, but I didn't understand it well enough to have an opinion. But my general attitude is try everything and put, a, and put all of the methods up against each other in competition and see what works best. 
Um, if, if somebody can come up with something that's better than this, then let it, let it take over. I'm all for that. Better but part. one thing that that method doesn't seem to deal with is you've got all this energy that it takes to evaporate water. And if you don't recover that energy, you're going to be highly inefficient. And that's the key to this whole thing, which I didn't talk about much, is exactly that. How do you condense the water vapor and get the energy back and put the energy back into um, put the energy back into the cold water? And that's exactly what we're trying to do. Hey, Morris, can you tell me more about what you understand when they call it dew evaporation? Is it uh, that was just uh, Professor Beckman's uh, name for, for the process. Was this the process where they take the moisture coming off the ocean and it's just the moist air and then they condense it? No, it wasn't anything to do with the ocean. Uh, that, that's yeah. another technique that's being used. Yeah, uh, and I, I admit that I haven't talked to him about it in quite a few years, so my memory is a little foggy on it, other than it, it had no moving parts. It was... Uh, polypropylene sheets that were put together in some sort of fashion and uh, evaporated water on one end just by natural processes condensed uh, uh, at the other end and the remaining water with our brine as it were was concentrated and that it was licensed and and used at uh, uh, various oil fields uh, Beyond that, my, my thoughts are that since you're, you're making prototypes and designing them, there, there might be some useful uh, hints or tips on what he did that might apply to your system. Well, I don't want to bring any licensed technology. Oh, the patents expired long ago. So uh, well, how whatever is in, in, in the literature. Can you please send me an email? Uh, just Google, be... Google John Allen and you'll find me really quickly. Okay, okay. and uh, I'll uh, proceed with Professor Beckman to see what he can send. That'd be great. And was that Arizona State, did you say? Ours? ASU, yes, in Tempe. Uh, Professor Beckman is one of my uh, summer lab colleagues uh, here at wow. W. That's where I teach. <laughs> You're there, Dan, at Arizona State? Yeah, I teach at Arizona State. What do you teach? Uh, computer modeling for design. Oh, very in nice. The industrial design program. Very good. Other questions for John? Yeah, I, I had one. Uh, most of the uh, solar apparatuses I'm familiar with um, seems to use mirrors to concentrate the sunlight onto the you know the action part of the device. Do you uh, anticipate having mirrors incorporated into this too? To um, uh, just re reflect the sunlight onto the, uh, the actual part that's doing the evaporation? No, I don't think that's actually a very good idea okay. because you, they're trying to get the water up to a really high temperature. They're trying to create steam. And so they're taking, you know, a mile, square mile of mirrors and focusing it on one point and getting the water very hot. And you don't need to get the water very hot. I mean, 40 degrees is not the ideal temperature, but 60 probably is. I'm talking centigrade. So you just want to get the water evaporated enough that you can harvest this, this water vapor. You don't want to boil it because you've put so much energy into boiling it. That's why they have to have all those mirror concentrators. So I think that's, I would put that in the category of a bad idea. Okay, thanks. Don't oh, tell the guy that's designing it. That that's out in um, that's in uh, somewhere. They're doing that in the desert. And yeah, Saudi some Arabia. of that's. Uh, if I remember right from my drive this summer, they're doing us molten salt, um, but that's for heat. I think. Molten salt is a very important ingredient in neural um, in, uh, thermal nucle nuclear reactors because of coolant, and that makes them safe. And this is something that's going to be in our future where they could, I mean, I hate nuclear reactors because they're so dangerous, but this makes them safe. Other questions, comments? Note that my talk was over a few seconds after two o'clock. Way to go.
I didn't plan it ahead carefully, but did you uh, did you hire the the Cardinals and the Robins to be in the background? By the way, no, I just left the door open. They yeah, that was really good. We do feed them bird seed. Yes. Well, we call that a bribe here in Wisconsin. Yeah, we have three acres with stream and woods, and I was here for six months. And all the realtors told me there is no such place like this until one day a realtor delivered me to the site. And I said, Way to pink go. house? I can't stand pink houses. Well, an hour later, I was ready to put in an offer. Way to go. I grew up in a pink house. I lived. Um, other questions? Um, so I'm going to, it'd be very interesting to see what your next scale ups are so that you can answer, um, or at least start to address some of the questions people had about cost and the, the secondary issues you're talking about, like with cleaning and cause that's why you do a larger and larger scale prototype. Do you have any idea what the next year, three years, five years holds for you? In <laughs> no, but in the next few months until the end of the semester in May, I hope to have a categorical proof that the fundamental concept works because there are people, skeptics, especially people who are familiar with thermodynamics who basically don't believe what I'm saying. And they don't believe it for multiple reasons. They say it violates the second law of thermodynamics. And I get in big arguments with them, friendly, friendly arguments but they just have this bias that says it can't work. And um, it's like magic, you're getting energy for free. And um, so we have to do a working prototype or we're not gonna convince 100%. We'll never convince Donald Trump, okay? So let's not worry about that. But we can convince any rational people who believe in science. And so that's my goal until the end of the semester is to have a categorical demonstration that the basic principles work. Then the next thing is to, beyond that, is to go to Burns McDonald and ask him to make a prototype that's maybe the size of a, of a dining room table that can be disassembled. And then, then we gotta figure out where we're gonna get the money to put it together out in the California desert or on the coast and give them some water so they can put the fires out. Very good. Plants. That's uh, it's as long as, as far into the future as I can think. Other questions? John, I'm thinking this is like you are like Wilbur and Mr. The Wright brothers with their contraption the first time it went off the ground. There's a lot of basic research that will be going into this and um, making it work better as time goes on. It's, it's going to evolve for sure, assuming it works, which I'm totally convinced it works. I've seen that it works. I did a stovetop experiment a couple of weeks ago and I proved that it works, almost. I can't even make dressing on a stovetop, so this will be good. Appreciate that. Um, other questions? I appreciate the opportunity yeah. and I really enjoyed trying to answer your questions. I hope I answered them. I'm looking for somebody who can tell me I'm totally wrong. I'm full of donkey doo-doo and the whole thing can't work so I can learn. I love being wrong. I wrote in my book, I love being wrong because I learned so much. Um, but so far, I haven't met that person. Well, we'll see if we can find one or two. So um, thank you, Tom, for the opportunity. <laughs> well, thanks for talking with us. Uh, like Terry was saying, you're in early days and you're out there. It's going to be interesting to see what uh, develops and how things go. And I'm supposed to give another talk, so we need to talk about that date. Yep, and that'll be on your book. Is that correct? Yeah. Good. All right. So I'm going to say on... Um, uh, I'm going to... Let's see if I can end the recording.